Anyway, let's talk about the results of the Ryan Detroit. Tell me, Mr. Love, since you are on stage today, give me one example of the end result of the riot in Detroit. Um, 43 dead. Okay, and nearly all those were what? Black. Black. Okay, Hadley, how about another example of the end result of the riots in Detroit? Very good. Daylin, another one? Um, really the property. Okay, uh, Taryn, one more? Oh, I hear that lot. But anyway, it's a long story. Jessica? Um, the total losses equal 150 million. Yeah, I'm really disappointed. I go to all this trouble to put this on video and you didn't go get after it last night and really know what's going on? Not yet. Not yet? Okay, all right. How about another example, Sarah? Uh, very, very good. Delancey, how about another one? What did the Prava do? Well, they gladly print in stories about the riot. And pictures of U.S. Army tanks in the streets of Detroit. Top Soviet newspaper. And then we told you that President Johnson received tremendous pressure as a result of the riots. And not only in Detroit, but the one that happened in Watts. So, here are three things in late July of 1967 that President Johnson did on the issue of rioting in the United States. Okay? Again, these are three things that President Johnson did in late July of 1967, after the Watts riot and after the riots in Detroit, concerning these riots to make things better. First thing he did, he put a special commission or committee together to investigate these riots and kind of find out why they were occurring. So the first thing that President Johnson did in late July of 1967 concerning the issue of the rioting in our country is he put together a special commission or committee and asked them to investigate these riots and try to figure out why they were happening and what we could do to prevent them. Okay? So again, President Johnson named a special committee or commission to investigate these riots that were occurring in the United States and what they could do to prevent them and, and uh, see why they were happening. Okay? The, th the second thing he did is he told Secretary of Defense McNamara to retrain and provide some new training to the National Guard concerning riot control specifically. They have not had any training specifically on riot control. And so what Johnson did is he, he ordered Secretary of Defense McNamara to provide new training for rioting to the National Guard so they'd be better prepared. I don't think he particularly cared for the fact that the rioters did what to the National Guard in, in, in Detroit? Okay. Took tanks from them. Okay? You're not very well trained in riot control if they can take your tanks from you. So he ordered Defense Secretary McNamara to issue new training standards for riot control to all National Guard units to prepare them in case they had another riot somewhere. And the third thing he did had nothing to do with the riots, but he thought this might uh, put a little bit of a lid on the, on the black issue and maybe would help blacks from rioting because they felt like maybe something good was happening for them. And this is when he appointed Thurgood Marshall to the United States Supreme Court. Remember, he early, Kennedy early in his administration appointed Thurgood Marshall to the U.S. Court of Appeals. And he was the first African American to serve in the U.S. Court of Appeals. Well, Johnson went even further and appointed Thurgood Marshall to the highest court in the land, the United States Supreme Court. Court, and obviously he became the first African American to ever serve on the nation's highest court. Can you put that on the board? It's on the His name? Yeah. <coughs> and we'll get a chance to visit Thurgood Marshall's gravesite, which is not far from John Kennedy's gravesite in Arlington. Yeah, so what he did, the third thing he did, is he appointed Thurgood Marshall who, remember, Kennedy had appointed to the U.S. Court of Appeals when he was president to kind of help the civil rights issue. Well, he moved him from the U.S. Court of Appeals 
to the highest court in the land as a Supreme Court Justice, Thurgood Marshall, uh, first African American to be named to the highest court in the country. Okay? Jonesy, you got confused. You got okay? So, again, he named a special committee to investigate these rioting, to try to figure out why they were doing it, what we could do better to prevent them. He also ordered Defense Secretary McNamara to train the National Guard in new rioting techniques in case there were riots in the future, they would handle them better, would be losing tanks to the rioters. And then he appointed Thurgood Marshall to the United States Supreme Court, who was the first black man ever to serve in that endeavor. Those are three things Johnson did after these two big riots to try to get things under control. Okay, the fifth example of violence that occurred during the Johnson administration was black power. Black power. Okay, black power. Now, I told you that the youth, Negro youths were looking towards a more violent way of handling civil rights, more radical way. And the first radical leader during the black power movement was Stokely Carmichael. And he basically took over the black power movement as the leader of that movement in 1966. So in 1966, a young black radical by the name of Stokely Carmichael became the new radical civil rights leader during the black power movement. Okay? In 1966, a young black radical by the name of Stokely Carmichael became the new radical civil rights leader in this black power movement. <coughs> now, if you want to get an idea of how radical Mr. Carmichael was, he was once quoted as saying this, which you don't really need to write down. He said, we've been saying freedom for six years and we ain't got nothing. What we're going to start saying is black power. And when Carmichael was asked about the nonviolent philosophy of Martin Luther King Jr. and the present civil rights movement, what his opinion of that was, and again, you don't have to write this down, he responded by saying this, now I have said time and time again, the only thing nonviolent about the civil rights movement has been Martin Luther King. Now we have never defined it as a way of life. I never have. I've always defined it as a tactic. So what is Stokely Carmichael saying when he's asked about the nonviolent philosophy of Martin Luther King Jr.? He's stating that the only thing nonviolent about the civil rights movement in America is Martin Luther King Jr. He's never defined the civil rights movement as nonviolent, and he's always defined nonviolence as just a tactic in the civil rights movement. So he definitely is not in that arena. Now, Dr. King's philosophy in the Black Power movement, he thought it was the most dangerous component and challenge to the civil rights movement. He did not like it at all. So Dr. King believed that the Black Power movement was one of the most dangerous components to the civil rights movement. And it would be very challenging to keep people involved in his nonviolent approach rather than jumping over to the more violent, radical approach. So Martin Luther King saw black power as a very dangerous component to the civil rights movement. And it would be a tremendous challenge for him and the SCLC to convince, especially the youth, black youths, that it was the way to go. Okay? So we'll kind of work on that. Now, here's what uh, Dr. King said. He said, We are all seeking political and economic power, but the phrase black power gives the wrong connotation. That was his philosophy in a, in a quote. Again, he said, We are all seeking political and economic power, but the phrase black power gives the wrong connotation. He absolutely did not like black power, and he did not feel it was in the best interest of the movement and it would be a hard thing to overcome convincing people to stay in a nonviolent movement. Okay? So, let's move on to the sixth example that turns out to be negative during the Johnson administration and it's simply entitled Martin Luther King Jr. versus Black Power. Now, what's Martin Luther King worried about? People pushing towards violence rather than nonviolence. Well, he gets no help in 1967 because in 1967, one single event 
push the black society more towards the black power movement. So something's going to happen, I'm going to tell you about, in 1967, that's going to convince more and more black people that maybe black power is the way to go and the nonviolent movement is not. And it occurred on June 6th, 1967. <coughs> June 6th, 1967. Now, now just, just keep the front page here. Don't turn it over yet, okay? Don't turn it to the next page. Just keep the front page here. Okay, whenever I pass these things out to you, what you're going to have is you're going to have a Pulitzer Prize winning photograph on the back. But I don't want you to look at the photograph until we read the front, okay? It makes more sense. But this is the event that's going to happen in 1967 that's going to push people more towards black power than it is staying with Martin Luther King's nonviolent approach. Okay? And then I will read this and then I'll lecture to you the important things you need to know. Okay? So don't look over yet. Okay, here we go. Welcome to Mississippi. There had been thunder when they last met. James Meredith and Old Miss, fall of 1962. Meredith becomes the first black person to enter the University of Mississippi, a bold-fisted challenge to discriminatory admission policies in America's colleges. Meredith's challenge meets a range of resistance, rioting, killings, so much that Meredith is under constant federal guard during his time at the university. With his graduation in 1963, the two-year duel lapses, but Mississippi would remember. June 6, 1967, Meredith is coming home after time in Africa at New York's Columbia Law School, home to Mississippi, on foot, walking alone and unarmed through some of the most remote and racially unsettled counties in the state. It is a 220-mile stretch from Memphis, Tennessee to Jackson, Mississippi. He is making his solitary journey to promote black voter registration and to combat the fears black feel about living and tra traveling freely in Mississippi. My objective was to expose all persuasive fear that existed. You had a million blacks in Mississippi. 12,000 registered to vote. Now this was two years after Johnson signed the Voting Rights Bill, but still no one had registered to vote. Even though Johnson had signed a bill saying that blacks have the right to vote, and all they had to do was go in and sign the book, most blacks still didn't sign the book. Now it wasn't because they didn't want to, it was because they were afraid of the consequences. They didn't know what would happen. Before, when they tried to push the point, someone would come out on the courthouse lawn and shoot them. They didn't know for sure whether there would be the same consequences. The question was, had we changed or hadn't we changed? Memphis, only 12 miles from Mississippi and once a giant kingpin of the Cotton Empire, is the starting point. People are attracted to his mission. A black soldier, a Memphis businessman, a minister from New York, spontaneously take up the march with them all on the basis of an inspiring chance meeting. Meredith is a compelling figure, helmeted, carrying an ebony and ivory walking stick, a gift from an African tribal chieftain. He walks past the hopeful and the hate filled. Occasional groups of blacks dot the roadside with quiet support and prayers. Even as cars full of angry whites dog him along Highway 51, wildly swerving in his direction. It is a continual intimidation. Threats of blind anger pour out. I hope to hell you die before you get there. He walks on. It is a hot, sultry afternoon. The heat shimmers above the steamy asphalt highway. Photographer Jack Thornell is covering the march for the Associated Press. We were leapfrogging with our cars, just staying a little ahead of him. From the bushes, a man's voice speaks quietly. James, James, I only want James Meredith. Meredith turns towards the voice in the bushes and gunshot ricochets along the road. The other marchers sprawl out on the highway. What alerted us was the first shot. I think it was a warning shot to scare everyone else away. I hopped out of the car and started taking pictures. Now, two successive blasts shatter the stillness. Meredith falls, riding on the asphalt. From the brush skirting Highway 51, a man is apprehended whom neighbors describe as a, quote, very nice man, as nice a neighbor as you could ask for. Meredith is rushed to a Memphis hospital. Emergency surgeon will carve 60 shotgun pellets from his head, neck, back, and legs. For his deadly assault on James Meredith, Aubrey James Norvell 
will spend 18 months in jail. Dr. Martin Luther King, Stokely Carmichael, Dick Gregory, and other black leaders continue the march. By the time they get to Jackson, they are 18,000 strong. The march will give rise to a new phrase, black power. Turn your book open, turn your paper open. You can see Meredith being shot. You can see Aubrey James Norbell circled with the black pin in the bushes. Oh, yeah. He's murdered him. Well, he didn't kill him. He oh, just, he he just him? no, he didn't kill him, but he shot him up good. Sixty shotgun pellets taken out of his body, and he only got eighteen months in jail for that. Now, what is the point I'm making on this? The point is, are people going to continue to support Martin Luther King's nonviolent approach, or are they going to move more towards the Black Power movement? Absolutely. So you can kind of read that story over and kind of go from there. But anyway. After this incident, many black leaders started to support the philosophy of black power rather than nonviolence. Now, this incident alone basically led to the formation of an organization called the Black Panthers. They were very militant black organization. You ever heard of them? You ever watched Forrest Gump? Sorry, I broke up the Black Panther Party. Okay. So the incident involving James Meredith really led to the formation of the militant Black Panthers organization. And they were a very radical, violent group, more violent than the Black Power Movement. They were founded in Oakland, California, and they were led by Huey Newton and Bobby Seale. So again, this incident in Mississippi involving James Meredith and him being shot really led to the formation of a new militant black organization known as the Black Panthers. Panthers. They were very radical, very violent, much more violent than Stokely Carmichael and the Black Power Movement. And they were led by Huey Newton and Bobby Seale, who formed the Black Panthers out of Oakland, California. Now, if you want to get an idea of how radical these guys were, Huey Newton once made the comment, political power comes through the barrel of a gun. That was his philosophy. Political power comes through the barrel of a gun. So, again, Meredith and his situation results in the formation of the Black Panthers, radical violent group founded in Oakland, California, led by Huey Newton and Bobby Seale. And Newton once made the comment concerning civil rights, political power comes through the barrel of a gun. Now, the Black Panthers were the most publicized group that advocated the Black Power Movement. They were part of the Black Power Movement, and they were the best known. Why? Because of their radical, violent ways. Do we need that quote? Okay, now the next thing I'm going to tell you before we end and move on to Martin Luther King and the Vietnam War is I'm going to make a comparison in philosophy between Martin Luther <coughs> King and the Black Power Movement. And I guarantee you this will be on your exam. You'll have to be able to give these four examples of the difference between Martin Luther King's nonviolent philosophy of civil rights and the new black power movement, okay? So make sure we have these for sure, okay? Number one, Martin Luther King Jr. and the SCLC, keep in mind they're part of his organization, they believed in a non-violent approach to civil rights. So Martin Luther King Jr. and the SCLC believed in a non-violent approach to civil rights. Where on the other hand, and this is still number one, the black power movement believed in armed self-defense. So number one, while Martin Luther King Jr. and the SCLC believed in a non-violent approach to civil rights, the black power movement believed in armed self-defense. Quite a difference, right? Non-violent approach to civil rights by Martin Luther King Jr. and the SCLC, and the Black Power Movement stating, we believe in armed self-defense. That's the first example. Number two, the SCLC and Martin Luther King Jr. believed in the integration of blacks and whites. What does that mean? The integration. Putting them together or mixing. Okay, so Martin Luther King Jr. and the SCLC believed in the integration of blacks and whites. What do you think the Black Power believed in? Total separation. Total separation. So number two, while Martin Luther King Jr. and the SCLC believed in the integration of black and whites, the Black Power Movement believed in total separation. 
of blacks and whites. Number three, where Martin Luther King Jr. and the SCLC believed in working with the system, the Black Power Movement believed in preparing for revolution. So whereas Martin Luther King Jr. and the SCLC believed in working with the system, the Black Power Movement believed in preparing for revolution. What's it mean when you're working with the system? Anybody have an example of that? Let's just take school for example. What would be an example of working with the system? Going to class. Okay. Okay, I'll try to, but well, I'll give you an example. I'm, I'm, the, I'm working with the system. And, and again, I don't take this personal. It's, it's, it's difficult. We have such great kids in here that are involved in so many activities that it's very difficult for you to be here all the time. Okay? And that bothers me. Instead of preparing for revolution and, and running all over and threatening to quit and... and uh, you know, making a big stink out of it, I choose to work with the system. I, you deal with what you have, okay? The kids are going to be gone, we're going to deal with it. I'm going to work with the system. Whereas if a person was preparing for revolution, they would be fighting you kids, pouring the homework on you, didn't care if you were in activities or not, said, I don't care, you know, you're going to take this test whether you missed the last three days at speech. You know, that's what I'm saying, okay? So people need, Martin Luther King Jr. wanted to work with the system. He knew he couldn't beat the system. He couldn't, is he going to beat the system on this civil rights thing? No, he wanted to work with it. But the Black Power Movement believed in preparing for revolution. And the fourth example of the differences between the philosophy of Martin Luther King Jr. and the Black Power Movement is that the SCLC and Martin Luther King Jr. believed in including white people in the Civil Rights Movement, right? A lot of white people marched at the Freedom Summer Project. They marched in Chicago. So Martin Luther King and the SCLC believed in including whites in the civil rights movement, well, guess what the black power movement believed? Exclude. They didn't want it. So Martin Luther King Jr. believed